Looking for reliable data to inform your decisions? At Insider Intelligence, we provide access to over 3,000 global sources, offering objective research on key topics like retail and e-commerce trends for 2023, marketplace growth, direct selling strategies for CPG brands, and insights on the 2023 holiday season. Make informed decisions with confidence. Learn more today at insiderintelligence.com. Hello, listeners. Today is Wednesday, August 9th. Welcome to Behind the Numbers, Reimagining Retail, an eMarketer podcast. This is the show where we talk about how retail collides with every part of our lives. I'm your host, Sarah Lebo. Today's episode topic is how Chinese companies are influencing retail in the U.S. First, let's meet today's guests. Joining me for today's episode, we have senior analyst Sky Canavez. Welcome back, Sky. Hi, Sarah. Always happy to be back. Always good to have you. And joining us on the Retail Pod for the first time is senior researcher and Asia Pacific lead Man Chung Chung. Hey, so I should be here. Great to have you. Okay, let's get started with free sample. Our Did You Know segment, where I share a fun fact, tidbit, or question. Today's question. Do either of you know the difference between a button-up and button-down shirt? That is a stumper. No, I don't. Is it a regional difference? It is Is not, but it's a good guess. Uh, Just to let you know, actually, my wife buy all my clothes, so I don't know anything about fashion. Okay, well, I'm glad we have you on the retail podcast to discuss it. A button down shirt has buttons on the collar that you can button down. You can button down the collar, whereas a button up shirt doesn't have those buttons. So its collar is more likely to be starched. You don't need to button the collar down. An Oxford shirt is typically a button down shirt. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, That is a very useful distinction. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it originated because the collars were flapping up while people were playing polo wearing the shirts. I also think that's where the polo shirt comes from, but maybe that's a tidbit for a different day. Okay, let's keep moving along past our fashion quiz into our next segment. Retell me this, retell me that. Where we discuss an interesting retail topic. Today's topic is how Chinese companies are influencing retail in the U.S. There are three big companies with Chinese roots that seem to be everywhere in U.S. e-commerce news recently. Xi'an, a fast fashion retailer selling out of China. Timu, the U.S.-based subsidiary of the same parent as Chinese retailer Pinduoduo. And TikTok, which is the sister app to China's Douyin, which we talked about on last week's podcast in terms of e-commerce. So my first question, which I'll hand over to you, Sky, is what is the retail opportunity for these companies in the U.S.? So for the U.S., e-commerce is still growing pretty steadily here, and that's because e-commerce penetration isn't anywhere nearly as high as in China. So in China this year, it's close to 46 percent, I believe. It's approaching 50 percent. There's not a lot of room for e-commerce growth in China as there is in the U.S., where it's only around 15% of sales taking place online. And even by 2027, it's only going to be around 20%. So e-commerce sales growth is actually growing faster in the U.S. than in China. And the U.S. is also the world's biggest retail market and will stay that way for the foreseeable future. That's according to our forecasts. So I think just the appeal of the U.S. market and the fact that e-commerce is continuing to grow here is really the big opportunity. And at the same time, I think China is a much more highly competitive market for retail. And there's also that slowdown in the consumer economy there. So it's really pushing the companies, the e-commerce players and the brands and manufacturers to look overseas for the next stages of growth. Yeah. To expand on that retail size data that you brought up. According to our forecast, total retail sales in the U.S. this year will be $7.3 trillion. In China, they'll be $6.4 trillion. So the U.S. is bigger overall. But then in terms of e-commerce, China's e-commerce sales are at nearly $3 trillion this year, whereas in the U.S. it's only about $1 trillion this year for total retail e-commerce sales. Manchun, can you expand on that forecast a little bit? Yeah. So just to kind of like answer your question, I think that 
they must have felt that there is some kind of advantage they could bring to the U.S. market that the incumbent here don't have. You know, Chinese companies, usually they're really close to the manufacturers. So, so they usually have a price advantage, speed advantage, all those stuff, right? So all those comes into play that, you know, would be able to allow them to perhaps carve a niche in the U.S. market. They have a price advantage for sure. Do they have a speed advantage or does the, the speed of shipping sort of slow them down? I guess, yeah, if they are in terms of speed, you can talk about production, turn around, right? Spotting an idea and turn it around within three days. That's the speed advantage. But when it comes to shipping, yeah, I would say, you know, typically if you're shipping from China, you talk about perhaps a week, two weeks or even longer. That's a good point. It takes a while to ship them. But in terms of like getting ideas listed on the site, Xi'an has like, intense AI that gets ideas listed like thousands of them a day. I saw it uh, quoted in Gizmodo. So two of these companies, TikTok and Timu, are very careful about their corporate identity as non-China based companies, despite their ownership being tied to China. Why is this distinction so important to these companies, Sky? Mainly, it comes down to the political tensions between China and some of its major trade partners like the U.S. So here, I think we've seen with TikTok, the biggest that we've seen unfold revolves around national security. Even as these companies move into retail, it's still digital and they're collecting vast amounts of consumer data. And there are some valid concerns about where that data is stored and who can gain access to it. And the big concern is Chinese government authorities. So that brings up the national security concerns and how that data could then be used against to harm U.S. interests. And then there are also concerns around data privacy, malware, human rights, labor and environmental practices, and even unfair trade practices since these companies are able to ship their goods to the U.S. using a, an exemption to import taxes for packages that are under $800 where they're being shipped directly to consumers. And that's something that major retailers like Walmart and Target that are importing large volumes of goods and have to pay taxes on them, they don't enjoy that advantage. So there are really a lot of concerns about how these companies and their links to China and how that they're harming U.S. interests at China's benefit. So I think the key for them to distance themselves from China has been to set up these overseas headquarters and store their data outside of China. Though, and at least in the case of TikTok, we've heard that hasn't necessarily always succeeded in, you know, maintaining the wall because employees in China have been able to access U.S. user data. And I think Timo's sister app, Pinduoduo, has run into some issues with malware and being taken off app stores outside of China as well. Yeah, even Xi'an, the company that is certainly based in China, they've also made efforts to have a better image in the U.S. They recently had that like TikTok influencer trip where they brought a bunch of influencers to come look at a factory. There was a lot of controversy about whether or not that was a realistic example of a Xi'an manufacturing site since it was sort of very clean and put together, but similar efforts to present a good face to U.S. consumers. And as they come under more scrutiny, we'll also see a lot more lobbying by these firms. So TikTok is one that's already vastly increased its lobbying budget. And I think we'll see similar efforts from Xi'an and Timu as they come under more scrutiny. There's already a U.S. congressional committee has singled them out and targeted them in a recent report that listed a lot of the concerns about these companies and how they do business. Yeah, I mean, another huge competitor for these companies in the U.S. is obviously Amazon. So I guess my next question is, how are Xi'an, Timu, and TikTok competing with Amazon, a company that already has 40% share of U.S. retail e-commerce sales? And Manchung, I'll go to you first on that one. Yeah, again, you know, it comes down to, again, you know, we talk about pricing, right? So they are selling products at a price just like ballpark, just by guess, like maybe 25% or 20% 20% of what I expected to pay for a similar product that might be so with, you know, a branded retailer. So it's just amazingly cheap. And if you don't feel like, you know, I'm just getting a slipper, a belt, I don't really care about the brand that much, right? I'm just going to go on these sites. Amazon is a little bit daunting, to be honest, to shop, especially for younger audiences. And I think that Xi'an and Team Wu, they both market heavily on TikTok and other social media sites. So they're able to sort of like 
you know, attract these younger audiences who are on TikTok and, you know, they want something fast. Yeah. I mean, if you browse TikTok, you get all of these Shein hauls that, that we've discussed before. They're huge on TikTok. And if you look at Timu at all, the prices are absurdly cheap. I mean, if you scroll through the site, the prices are astonishingly low. Yeah, well, they have a range, I would say. So I think, yeah, it comes to like daily household products. You talk about like things that are $5 below, right? Sometimes $10. But if you go to like consumer electronics, we're looking at perhaps like 100 possibly more. So just to put out there, it's not like everything is $5, 10 That's a great point. And I know Shein has been getting into some higher end products as well. Sky, anything to add in terms of Shein, Timu, and TikTok competing with Amazon? So I think well, we're seeing shifts in how Amazon, you know, strategizes what its response will be. So far, it hasn't really come out with anything targeting them specifically. But I think as Amazon Prime particularly becomes more about paying for the convenience of getting things faster, Amazon's making huge commitments to one day and same day delivery. And that's becoming a real value add of Prime membership when you need things that day or the next day. And that's going hand in hand with their push to sell more of the kinds of products that you want quickly, namely things like grocery, food and beverage, personal care products, household supplies. We're seeing phenomenal sales growth for Amazon in these categories in our most recent forecasts. And I think that's an area where they're continuing to push for. For a lot of other products, inexpensive fashion products or, you know, home goods or consumer electronics accessories that people have already been buying on Amazon for a long time from these Chinese merchants, often you can wait a week or 10 days. And so I think we're seeing consumers are willing to make that trade off between price and convenience for certain types of goods. And at the same time, you know, they're able to sell them so cheaply because selling at Amazon has really started to come at higher price. According to Marketplace, Pulse earlier this year reported that Amazon is now taking more than 50% of seller revenues. And that's a combination of their take rate and fees for fulfillment and advertising. And it's up from about 40% five years ago. So that's really made more sellers feel dissatisfied because they're not able to even get the money that they're selling products for. And so maybe look to other channels to sell on not just Timu and Shein, but places like Walmart, which has launched another marketplace to compete with Amazon as well. It's really wild to be talking about Amazon as no longer the cheapest option. We did an episode on Ikea a while ago, and we were talking about how Ikea started off as the cheapest furniture retailer, and Amazon's really undercut Ikea. So Ikea is now sort of seen as like a little more high end than some Amazon products. And now we have these companies undercutting Amazon, where Amazon is seen as a step more expensive than them. It makes me wonder where where the bottom is. Yeah, I think sooner or later, something has to give, right? I think, just you know, for Chinese companies, they often enjoy a really close relationship with the manufacturers. So they're willing to sometimes, you know, bend over backward for them. In the case of Xi'an, I think they're able to ask the manufacturers to produce smaller batches compared to other retailers. So in that case, there's less waste, right? If something that doesn't sell, they're not going to lose as much. So that's sort of like the advantage for them. Also funny to be talking about Shein in terms of less waste, because that's one of the biggest dings that fast fashion gets. But I get what you're saying. There's definitely less waste and less of an economic hit for them in terms of over merchandising. Okay, let's keep moving. It's time for our segment, Red Hot Retail. This is our guest's opportunity to give us their very specific and potentially risky predictions on a topic. The predictions can be mild, medium, spicy, or extra hot. The higher the spice level, the riskier the prediction. Our guests will tell me what spice level to predict and then share a prediction. Today, Sky and Manchung are sharing four predictions for how retail will change in the U.S. as a direct result of Chinese manufacturers. Sky, why don't you go first? So my first prediction is that, and this one is, I'm going to say medium spicy, Oof. but I think that TikTok, despite the success of its sister app, Douyin in China, with in e-commerce and social commerce and live streaming, that TikTok's going to continue to stumble through its muddled commerce strategies in the U.S. Before, it will, I think it will eventually find a winning formula, but that's going to take some time. And so far, its efforts are not 
yielding a lot of success. And I don't see them particularly taking off. So TikTok Shop is its real brand focused initiative targeting US merchants. And brands just haven't been getting on board with that. They've done some private label efforts overseas, manufacturing their own products or TikTok developing its own brands, particularly in fashion. And they're looking to expand into other lifestyle categories. I don't see that getting a huge amount of traction unless they really pick up a winning Shein type of formula of, you know, connecting with thousands of manufacturers. And I don't think they have that kind of manufacturing base. And the other is they're looking at developing a team like marketplace in the U.S. But at the same time, I think they'll be hampered because they don't have the same network of suppliers in China that Pinduoduo and Timu's parent company does and has been able to leverage for years to become one of the biggest e-commerce players in China. They've really focused a lot more on live streaming and getting brands to sell in China. And that's been how they've gotten to the where they are in terms of e-commerce success in China. And that hasn't really played out the same way in the U.S. And I think as it tries to keep pushing commerce with these new formulas, it can also potentially run into legal troubles if it's, for example, using the algorithm to promote its own products or using data from other brands and merchants to develop its own products. These are some of, similar to some of the legal challenges that Amazon has faced as it's become both a marketplace and a competitor to its sellers. Yeah, TikTok has done a really good job of turning its users into buyers, but there's only so far it can go there. We talk a lot about how Gen Z's shopping habits are still malleable, so more of them are willing to buy on social. But a lot of them, most Gen Zers, are already adults, so their shopping habits are starting to firm up. I think it's going to take Gen Alpha aging into their own spending power for social buying to hit the next level. Maybe I'm looking too far ahead now. Okay, Man Chung, why don't you give us another spice level and another prediction? Okay, I'm going to start with a mild one. Mm. So with Chinese retailers, I think it's going to, it goes without saying, putting more pressure on U.S. retailers in terms of pricing, in terms of being able to launch new products and introduce them into the market. But I would say that you may see more products with quote-unquote Chinese characteristics, you know, so... You see, you know, when you think about Japan, it's about the anime, the sushi, the cool culture. When you think about Korea, you know, you think about K-pop, right? K-drama. So now, you know, you may see more Chinese products that are out there and, you know, that brings some kind of like soft power and prestige to Chinese brand. I think that's one that I've been thinking of. You know, if you think about like Uniqlo, how they have like different animes on the t-shirts, right? That's just help introduce anime to the mass market. Following up on that question, what are the quote unquote Chinese characteristics that we can expect to see? I think just sort of like micro innovation, like products that are bring some little convenience, maybe a little bit more kind of nuanced than what we're used to here. Smaller products that are more kind of you know, smartly designed, like automated kind of so stored out there, a rice cooker that you can remote control with your phone and all types of different settings or like a mop that automatically cleans itself, something like that. A rice cooker that you could remote control with your phone would be so perfect because before we started recording today, I was like, I'm going to want lunch after this podcast. I should start my rice cooker now. And then I was like, no, no, my rice will be overcooked by the time that we're done podcasting. So if I could use my phone to turn it on halfway through the podcast, I would have been perfect. Instead, I'm going to have to wait for my rice to cook after. So I'm all for that prediction. (laughs) Um, Sky, why don't you give us our next spice level, next prediction? So my prediction is pretty spicy, and it kind of follows from Manchung's last prediction of bringing more Chinese-style products to the U.S. I think Timu is going to succeed in bringing a new form of social commerce to the U.S., not just the products, but how they're bought. And this is a concept of group buying that it really pioneered in China. This is a concept of group buying that Pinduoduo pioneered in China. And that's often been compared to Groupon, but a key difference is that Pinduoduo got people to buy by convincing them to get in on deals with their family, friends, social acquaintances, and that the more 
products were bought, the more that people were willing to order, the lower the price would go. So it would go lower and lower. So it was really much more gamified than Groupon. And it involved people who you had some connection with as opposed to getting in on a deal with strangers. So I think this kind of commerce and deal hunting, group deal hunting has enormous potential to take off in the U.S. among younger consumers, you know, the TikTok generation that's looking on TikTok for Amazon finds and deals of the day and discounts. I think that'll, you know, potentially be successful. It's pretty spicy. It's a little far-fetched, but I think it could happen. And if anyone can do it, Timur will. With group buying, are you all buying the exact same product or is it like I make a purchase and I say, if you buy in the next two hours, you can use my 20% off code? That's more a referral part of the gamified social commerce that can certainly play into it. But the group buying would generally be for the same product. And it can even fuel a kind of on-demand production where the product hasn't even been manufactured yet. And you're kind of putting in your order based on how many pieces are going to be ordered, the price is then determined based on that. I don't think that's a wild prediction. I mean, that's really consistent with how influencing and celebrity works in the US already. The only reason that I'm a little hesitant on this is that we know that Gen Z looks for personalization and individualization, but there may be room for that within this kind of buying. So, Well, if everybody wanted to buy a remote-controlled rice cooker then we could all in make your, our rice after this podcast. In, in your group, you can convince all your friends to buy the remote control rice cooker. So not everything needs to be so personalized. And I think there is room for good deals. And I mean, we see limited edition type products from major brands and collaborations that sell out you know, very quickly. So yeah. it's not like entirely personalized, but just enough to make it special. Okay. And Manchung, why don't you give us our final spice level, final prediction? So this one is a little bit spicier. I would say in a scale of one to five, it's a five. So (laughs) highly unlikely, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. So Amazon is going to be forced to introduce a new platform to attract younger audiences with more social commerce characteristics. So they could either look into launching a separate platform or perhaps a car company like Pinterest or Snap wish.com, but that's probably highly unlikely given that they are under antitrust scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a reasonable prediction to some extent. I think that Amazon is still not, this is my personal opinion, super enjoyable to scroll, which I think makes it a good reason it might want to create a new like Gen Z focused platform. It also might be a good reason it might not end up doing this because it's priority isn't being super fun to scroll. But if it started a new format, a new platform, it could also sell ads separately on that format, sell retail media ads, which we know is a huge opportunity for Amazon. So it may be something they're eyeing. And we talked last week about their Inspire feed and how that's basically a TikTok copy targeting Gen Z. So I don't know that it's inconceivable that they would spin off a separate platform. I've often wondered when they were going to take the Alibaba type of approach of creating a purely branded higher end premium platform like Tmall, which is a platform for branded storefronts, while Taobao was more the undifferentiated sellers and consumer to consumer sellers or small brands and merchants selling the low cost goods and have that kind of split. So, but maybe they would look more towards targeting the younger generation with a more Timu style marketplace platform where everything is cheaper. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, it doesn't feel like Amazon has capitalized on branded storefronts. Most of the brand's names on there feel like a collection of letters and numbers and words that aren't that recognizable. Since we talked about Amazon Inspire last week, Sky, have you revisited that platform at all? I have not, but I'm still thinking about the inflatable human-sized dog bed. (laughs) I uh, was just thinking about that today, how we talked about Inspire. We talked about how we never visited it, and I have not visited it since. Manchung, have you ever scrolled through Amazon Inspire? This is the first time I heard of it. Like I said, my wife do my (laughs) shopping for me. (laughs) Okay. Well, that is all we have time for today. So thank you, Sky. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Manchung. Thanks for having me. Please give us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Instagram at behind the numbers underscore podcast. Thank you, listeners, and to Victoria, who edits the podcast. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Reimagining Retail, an e-marketer podcast. 
And tomorrow, join Marcus for another episode of the Behind the Numbers Daily. 